Welcome students, this is Anthropology 325. Uh, I'm Alan Boris speaking to you from the Anthropology Lab at Kenai Peninsula College. This uh, it will be lecture one of two uh, on traditional Denina social and political organization. This is long so I'm going to break it into two, two parts. We'll go to about half, uh, about an hour into it and then we'll do the second part uh, as a second lecture. So it will be appear something like Denina Social Organization 1 and Denina Social Organization 2. So the first uh, review here, I think we've talked about this, concept edict versus emic. Uh, edict is a view of the culture as analyzed by a non-participant, an anthropologist in other words, or perhaps a journalist or a sociologist or um, whatever from outside of the uh, being a participant of the culture tends to view, at least anthropologically, culture as a system composed of comparable parts. So the comparative method has a long tradition in anthropology and uh, to do a comparative method one has to have uh, descriptions of culture um, based on similar units. That'll be um, apparent on the next slide as we talk about Franz Boas. An emic view then views culture as understood by a participant. So culture is not composed of comparable parts. Culture is a whole. Culture is a whole thing. Um, social organization, the topic of today for example, is not distinct from religion uh, in many cases. Um, that is the, it's, it's, it isn't viewed as uh, a subject for analysis. So the, these two views are uh, important for us to understand uh, and uh, be clear about. Uh, I'm, I'll take the position that one is not better than the other. It is absolutely critical for anthropologists to understand an emic point of view and to be sensitive to the importance of understanding culture as a whole. By the same token, those who are participants in a culture uh, can um, understand their world better from uh, an outsider's description of it. So they're both important. The terminology, by the way, uh, is attributed to a linguist named Kenneth Pike who derived edic from phonetic and emic from phonemic. So phonetic is actual sounds but phonemic is meaning given to those sounds. Uh, one could not understand phonemic sounds without having some knowledge of the language. So uh, innate, er, uh, innate knowledge of a language is important, whereas anyone can hear the sounds of a language, but they wouldn't ha necessarily have meaning. So that's where it's derived from. and. Uh, and let's go further into an edic point of view. So Franz Boas, we've talked about him before, uh, uh, sent his students out and he himself described cultures in the early 20th century um, by chapters. Technology or material culture, social structure, subsistence, politics, and religion. And those became categories of analysis and the basis of the comparative method between cultures to try to understand um, princ basic principles of culture. Um, so this is one view uh, and loosely we're going to take that view. We're going to now embark on social structure for the Denina. Um, focusing to the extent we can on the early social structure of pre-contact times, uh, although that's not really possible. No one was there to describe it, but we can learn a lot from the mythology, from the stories, from uh, Osgood's attempt to describe the social organization and so on. Um, just as an aside, uh, Edward Sapir was a student of Franz Boas and Cornelius Osgood. There he is on the lower left 
was a student of Sapir's, and it was, of course, Osgood who wrote the ethnography of the Denina that much of this uh, description is based on. So there was a sort of a genetic, an intellectually genetic connection between these three points of view. Uh, there are other approaches. Um, if you've taken other anthropology classes, you may have been exposed to Marvin Harris's infrastructure, structure, and superstructure. Infrastructure is basically economy or subsistence and technology. Structure would be social structure, among other things, and superstructure having to do with ideology, beliefs, religion. And uh, that's, um, in my mind, not dramatically different um, Although from uh, Boaz, although Harris would argue that infrastructure is tends to be a determining factor in the other two. Richard Adams, uh, another view, looks at energy. So there are um, parts of culture that produce energy, food energy, for example. Subsistence is the production of food energy. Uh, from that are derived structures like social structure and other types of things. And there is ideology, re loosely religion, beliefs, uh, spirituality, and he would see these more as three intertwined parts of a whole. So, emic view, uh, we uh, in this class have a lot of access to emic view. Uh, these are some of the books. Uh, these are uh, Denina perspectives translated into English, but some of them uh, in uh, written in Denina. So we have um, we have access to emic views via the written word. It's not exactly a direct emic view. It would be in one's head. It's via the written word. A little bit on the theory of social structure. Um, broadly speaking, there's two approaches probably more, but two dominant approaches. One is called descent theory, tracks back to A.R. Ratcliffe Brown, and focuses on kinship as, as a way to uh, pass on material items, status, and other sorts of things. Very heavily materialistic um, and looking at uh, social organization as descent. Whereas alliance theory, championed by Claude Levi-Strauss, among others, looks at kinship as a way to form alliances for mutual self-help, for adaptation. Um, and this is the view we're going to take in this class. We're going to look primarily at Denina social organization in terms of alliances. Um, Claude Levi-Strauss uh, emphasized that there are two processes to pro produce structures, cultural structures, and that these are imprinted on children's brains and hence came to be subconsciously understood and, and then a way to interpret the, uh, the adult world as people grew to adulthood. And this is a sophisticated idea but it's one that's important for all of us to understand. The two processes are mythology and social structure. Um, so mythology, for example, there are stories. Stories that uh, talk about how to deal with complex issues. They're allegorical in nature. They have characters. They have uh, a, a kind of a plot. Um, and th and through the stories, good and bad, right and wrong, us and them, male, female, what is it to be a male, what is it to be a female, or an other, um, uh, all uh, are portrayed in the stories. Children hear the stories and then tend to organize their adult world around them. In um, modern Western culture, for example, everyone's heard the three little pigs. And you can go through the story, and, and you heard it in grade school. And at that level, it was just a story. But it also portrays manifest destiny. It portrays the dominance of culture over nature. And the wolf gets it in the end. And the wolf gets it in the end from the pig who worked really hard, 
built the brick house, uh, hard work, uh, a version of the Protestant ethic, and the good life will come to you. Frivolous, bad little pigs, the ones who weren't working hard and were, were goofing around, they were saved by the hard-working pig. So that imprints on people's brains and hard work and, and uh, dominance over nature become a theme, whether you're consciously aware of it or not. So through looking at another culture's mythology, as Levi Strauss taught us, we can gain a lot of insight. Social structure, too, is a way to um, organize the world. Who, who, who do you have sexual access to? Who's a potential marriage mate? Who do you call sister? Not necessarily biological sister. Who do you call brother? Who's eligible for marriage? Uh, the social structure becomes an imprint for the organization of culture. You either are or aren't, for example, uh, someone to whom one could have sexual access. Um, and this uh, then it is reflected in social organizations, and we'll talk about the Denina clan system as one representation of that. George Lakoff uh, is another part of social organization. It's a little f further distant than uh, as far as trying to understand, say, Denina. Uh, but in modern context, he describes two structures, the stern father parenting model and the co-parenting model. To the stern, in the stern father approach, the world is perceived as a dangerous place. And it's the father's, in this view, not the mother's, the father's job is to make his children strong in the face of impending hostility. The co-parenting model, of course, is mother and father. The world is a place to form alliances is the theme. And it's the parent's job, together, to show children how to form alliances. So one focuses on alliances and one focuses on um, sort of independence. So it's possible that there were similar, similar models of parenting uh, among indigenous people and uh, the part of this that we're going to um, use is the co-parenting model, uh, although it's dangerous to say that pre-contact Denina would actually have adopted that, uh, but Clearly, there is a theme of alliances that, um, and partnerships that permeates Denina culture. So, this is now Denina culture, the uh, one, one way to look at it. So, this is a kind of notation that anthropologists use. The triangles are males, the circles are females, the equal sign means married to, and the straight lines are generational, if it's vertical, and these would be consanguine kin, that is blood kin. So uh, this is father, this is mother, this is son, this is daughter, and I've reproduced a, sort of a theoretical set of villages here. Obviously, any one family may have two sons and no daughters or whatever combination. So this isn't actual people, but this is a model of how social organization works. Uh, looking at three principles, matrilineal clan membership, moiety exogamy, and avunculocal residence. So we'll go through each of those. If we were to magically go back in time to, say, 1200 A.D. to a Denina village somewhere in Cook Inlet um, or over in the Mulchatna or Lake Clark area, we learned the language and we gained the trust of the people uh, and we set about to understand social organization. We're to that chapter. And we interviewed people in Village 1 and we talked to this household and we asked what clan are you 
and the mother would say uh, green or Nuji clan and we'd ask the children what a clan are you they would say same clan Nuji we're green and uh, the father would say I, I'm Tolchina so we look at the next household same thing next household oh I'm Kali and my children are Kali so in every instance we would learn that the children are the same clan as the mother. Go to village two, same principle. Children are the same clan as the mother. And this would then, we would don't have to go to everyone to talk to, to ask everyone what it is, what your clan membership is. We would have, have established the principle of matrilineal clan membership. So Denina were matrilineal. Um, and uh, and then we would look at the marriage patterns. And okay, so you're you're Nuji, this person number two here, married to Tolchina, person number one. Same thing here. Okay, here uh, Kali, married to Tolchina, also. Here uh, we go to village two, uh, Nolchina, married to Kali clan. So we would eventually figure out that there were two sets of clans and that one had to marry outside of one's set of clans. So a set of clans is called a moiety. It's divided into two parts like the American League and the National League in baseball. Two parts and one set of clans would belong to moiety A one set of clans would belong to moiety B. This is similar to Tlingit uh, system. This is similar to the Atna system. Uh, the Denina, apparently the moieties were not named. If they had, were, it wasn't recorded. Uh, but everyone would know what clan they were and then by definition what moiety they were in. Little uh, phonological thing, if it ends in A, it's going to be the first moiety, Tolchina, Nolchina. If it ends in I, it's going to be the second moiety. And there are others. Uh, I just put two on here just because it gets real complicated if you try to chart out more than, more than, um, more than just four sets of clans or four clans. So this is what everyone would know. This is part of that uh, organization of the world that. Levi Strauss talked about who do you who's a potential mate so moiety exogamy exogamy means you have to marry outside of some group in this case outside of your moiety um, uh, sometimes there is endogamy where you are required to marry within a certain group um, or or in or encouraged to marry within a certain group uh, modern American culture tends to have class endogamy, for example. If you're wealthy and rich, you're sort of expected to marry someone else wealthy and rich, and so on. So, um, we've established two principles here. Um, a, a matrilineal clan system and moiety exogamy. And the third principle is avunculocal residence. So let's marry someone off here. Uh, let's take um, this individual here, 25, and we're gonna. He he grows to adulthood, and we're going to marry him off. And uh, and there were two principles of preferred marriage partners for a man, fathers sister's daughter or mother's brother's daughter. The father's sister's daughter, this relationship, was preferred uh, even though by our terms it's a cousin. It's a particular cousin, a cross cousin. We'll define that in a moment. 
but uh, this does follow the rules, uh, incest rules, for Denina. You have to marry outside of your moiety. So he's moiety one, he's the Tolchina clan, and she is Kali, she's moiety two, so it follows the rules. He cannot marry uh, someone from his, his sister, naturally. He can't marry someone who's of his own clan, even though not a, a, a sister. He can't marry anyone from the Nalchina clan or any of the others that are part of his moiety. He can only marry someone of the opposite moiety, in this case Nuji or Kali or the others that um, may have been identified. So she's an eligible marriage partner, as is every female in this group, and every female in Village 3 would be a mem uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the Nuji clan uh, people of this village would be um, eligible marriage partners. So, uh, so he would know this, and why is this preferred? So, this is a village composed avunculocally of purple or Nalchina clan males. He's a purple or Nalchina clan. He could marry down here, but that's a village composed of yellow or Nalchina clan. And here's a village composed of Nuji males. So this is to his advantage to marry into this village or one like it that is dominated by um, uh, Tolchina clan. There's no restriction to keep him from marrying here, but he would be at a disadvantage because he would be viewed as an outsider from a clan system. Sort of like uh, if you're a Democrat and you m move into a, v a, a town or an area that's dominated by Republicans. Nothing against it. Can't no law against it, but um, you would have a harder time perceived to be an outsider, at least the way the modern world seems to work, and vice versa, Republican into a Democratic stronghold. And that might be not be the best example, but it's something like that. So he has advantages here. Moreover, a second person lives in this village, and that's his mother's brother right here individual one so that person would have educational responsibilities for this young man he would be his teacher so as he got into six seven eight nine whatever ten years of age he would go to this village and he would live with his mother's brother and his mother's brother would teach him how to trap teach him how to track animals, teach him how to hunt, teach him how to build a brush camp, teach him how to dress in the winter for various types of conditions, teach him how to fish. All of these things that, and probably the stories, that it's important for him to know as an adult. He lives in this village, so to have his uh, benefactor, if you will, be there as well that uh, that would be a, a positive thing for him so it's a marriage strategy the sister for example individual 26 here she would get that information from her mother uh, her mother would teach her to sew skins her mother would teach her to flesh hides and her aunts we'll see in the next couple of slides how she how this woman 26 refers to individual 18 as mother and to individual 20 as mother. The same term and that's called a classificatory kinship system. Not a biological mother but someone who uh, who where the relationship is a mother-daughter relationship and often this is referred to by in English by the aunties. Aunties. Special people. 
So when this individual moves here, uh, either marrying someone in this group, either her, or this individual is also another preferred marriage partner, mother's brother's daughter. Uh, she's of the opposite clan of him. She's in the right moiety, so he might marry her. Doesn't have to, but it would be advantageous for him to do so. What we've created here then through this marriage system is an alliance between these two villages. An alliance. Let's say that village one has expansionist tendencies. They want to take over the hunting areas of village two. Or maybe they want to take over the village, uh, fishing areas of village two. Um, and, uh, and, well, that's, yeah, we're strong, we're powerful, let's take them over. But what would prevent that? Uh, this man, for example, or uh, 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 this person, for example, saying, hey, wait a minute, my brother lives in that village over here. Or this person saying, hey, wait, my sisters live over there, my nephews are over there. So this is a way to suppress hostilities and to enhance alliances. So if village one was having a hard time, maybe um, maybe Wolverine got into their fish cache pits, or maybe bacteria did. Uh, there would be strong alliances and strong impetus for village two to help out village one, and there indeed was a mechanism for that, and that was through the Geshka partnership that we'll talk about later. Here I've identified a Geshka, just randomly picked number five here, uh, and uh, individual 19 here. So uh, these are males, but a Geshka could be a female. A Geshka is a chief. Uh, uh, overall um, chief of the village, wise, older, thoughtful, and Geshkas could have partners as well. So this Geshka could be partners with this Geshka, and that would enhance that uh, redistribution of food, for example, that could happen between the two villages. It would be up to the Geshka to make that decision as well as the Geshka to make the decision for the distribution of food within his or her own village. And we'll come to that later. So essentially what we have is males marrying out of the village and females staying in the village and this complex sort of thing where um, where uh, alliances are formed by the rules of, of matrilineal rules, moiety exogamy, and avunculocal residence. So you should understand this process. You should, uh, uh, you should understand why it works the way it does. But the under underlying theme is alliances and forming a unit for uh, procuring and distributing food. So uh, we'll come to the term ugilka, clan helpers. These are the clan helpers. They're not members of the same clan, but they work together for subsistence purposes. These are the ugilka, or clan helpers, of village two, of village four, of village three. They work together uh, for the pro procurement of fish, and uh, would, uh, would share other types of resources in the uh, gathering of subsistence. This is a classificatory kin term from a male point of view. And the next slide will be from a female point of view. They're slightly different. I'll try to post these on your blackboard so you can have these and ponder it uh, in addition to being on the screen. So this is a chart system that anthropologists use. Again, the triangles are males and the circles are females and the equal sign is married too. And uh, that makes it a final kin. And the solid lines are consanguine kin. Uh, so we always have it from a point of view. That point of view is called ego. 
Um, the next one will be the point of view, a uh, female point of view, but we're interested in the terms because the terms determine um, how you treat somebody and how they treat you. So just like today, if you call someone uncle, even though he might not be a biological uncle, it's very common in Alaska to have a family friend be, you'd call uncle as you were growing up. He treats you as an uncle niece or uncle nephew, and those are established patterns. The blue are moiety, one moiety, and the red would be the opposite moiety, but they of course would also be uh, members of a clan. So here's ego. Uh, to describe that classificatory kinship system, notice that ego calls his mother Shaunkta, right here. Uh, my mother is what that means, but he also calls his aunt Shaunkta, my mother. So as we pointed out in the previous slide, this is a mother-son relationship, and this is a mother-son relationship. She has rights to both have rights to uh, to instruct, reprimand, in uh, whatever it might be, as the person is young. Here's another shaunkta here, his father's brother's wife. So this is that <laughs> encoded into classificatory kin uh, terms the idea that it takes a village to raise a child to have mother-son relationships or mother-daughter as the next slide will show um, is uh, is then uh, gives responsibility to a number of people to help raise that young person. Um, these are grandparents. Uh, this is the parental generation. This is one's own generation. So anyone here who's a red circle from this person's standpoint is an eligible marriage partner. He picked her, Shau, his wife. Um, and this person is not kin to him. That doesn't have a kinship turn. Um, so any of these would potentially be um, marriage partners. The terms older and younger are used in Denina. Uh, this is um, this is older brother and this is younger brother from Ego's point of view and this is younger sister and older sister and that's a, a feature of Denina culture. It's very common in other cultures where the, the age difference um, plays an important part in relationships um, uh, between the individuals. Older sister, for example, can do can reprimand ego shauda. She's not quite shatunkta, but she's shauda. Younger sister can't. And these are children, and it goes on down. So let's look at the female uh, one. This is from a female point of view. So I just randomly made her red. Uh, she's ego, and she has. We'll go. We'll circle the the mothers again. That's her mother, Shaunkta. Uh, she's a Shaunkta. That's her mo her mother's sister. Um, and uh, she's a Shaunkta. She's she can treat that individual as mother. That's her father's brother's wife. So the same. It takes a village to take it to raise a child concept. So here she's married in a blue uh, or purple person. Uh, Shugen. Shugen, my husband, and um, and therefore all of these uh, relationships are defined. So when a when a uh, when a Denina traditionally would introduce themselves, they would start with the phrase uh, Shaida Shaizi. Uh, this is who I am and my name, and they would say their name, and then they would go through their whole genealogy. Shaunkta, my mother is. I would say, I would say, Shaunkta Evelyn, Shatukta Martin. My mother is Evelyn, and my father is Martin. And I would go through my whole genealogy. 
uh, I would talk about my my area, my clan, my clan, my uh, where I live, my village, and but especially I would talk about my genealogy because why? Because that places the stamp of uh, who you are in relation to everyone else and establishes rights, obligations from a social standpoint, social organization standpoint. So, to uh, uh, so to look at this to sort of summarize the clan. Then uh, we had, here we had again Moiety A and Moiety B. Uh, these were the names of the clans as Osgood described them. Wrangel uh, in Russian uh, times described some clans, and there's others. Um, clans apparently could form. Uh, new clans could form, in which case they'd have a clan origin story. Some suggestions that some clans may have moved in from Atna territory. Uh, so they they changed um, and could change. But a clan was not a particular village. That they, they will talk in some of the stories about a village being a clan of yay and such. I think what they're referring to is that's the Avunki local village. Um, yeah, these are the clans. And all having a clan origin story. Uh, and a clan crest. Osgood describes face paint patterns uh, as having, uh, uh, as, as being part of whether it was potlatching, you know, celebrations or whether they did it every day, I don't know. I don't think anyone does. Uh, but especially at celebrations, they would have their uh, crest of their of their clan. And there might have been other reflections of clan. There might have been um, beadwork patterns, bead colors, earlier quill work patterns and quill colors of garments to reflect clan. Um, Identity, very important, very significant part of identity. You never lost your clan. Always the clan was the important, uh, an important part of your identity. So marriage, uh, uh, marriage was moiety exogamous to form alliances, and the preferred partner a cross cousin, father, sisters. Uh, that should be daughter from a male standpoint. Let me get my little marker out here. Pen. Cross that out. Fathers or mothers, brothers, daughters. So from that person's point of view, uh, cross cousin means um, it, it, the opposite gender of a parent. So father, male, sister, female. Male, female. These are cross cousins here. These are parallel cousins. Same gender. Father, father, male, male, um, father, uncle, I'm sorry, male, male. So these are the same. So these are parallel cousins. Same thing over here. Mother, uh, uncle, female, male, cross cousins. Female, female, mother, aunt, or in Denina terms, mother, mother, parallel. So from these people's standpoint, Cross cousins are potential mates, even though they're cousins, and parallel cousins are not. Uh, parallel cousins are like brothers and sisters, and punishable by uh, traditionally by incest rules. Uh, even though in our modern terminology, not incest, in that terminology, incest because it's based on clans and moieties. Mate selection was by parents. Um, upon marriage, the husband was required to spend a year working for the bride's parents. This is from Osgood. Or a wealthy man could pay a bride price. So this becomes a symbolic statement of commitment. And, um, and after bride service, then the husband received gifts from the bride's couple, again symbolic, and by the way would be repaid if the marriage later dissolved. Uh, residence was a local, um, 
or tended to be. Neolocal was permitted, but rare, meaning you could live anywhere you wanted. And we already talked about why you wouldn't necessarily want to, because the village uh, would be a place for self-help of one another. And if you were thought to be an outsider, then you would um, there would be less reason to help that person. Divorce was informal, nothing fancy, uh, but children stayed with the mother because she would they would, children would be of the mother's clan. Polygamy and sororate, uh, and sororal polygamy, uh, a man was permitted multiple wives, uh, and usually they were sisters. Uh, it was um, not practiced into historic times, to my knowledge, or if it was, it's very rare and probably was pretty rare uh, in uh, pre-contact times as well. Only wealthy men who could support multiple wives would take more than one. Uh, either way, the wives would be of the same clan. Obviously, if they were sisters, they'd be of the same clan. Sororate upon death of a wife, a man was expected to marry her sister if available. So this then uh, maintained continuity because the children, if there were any, would then be of the same clan as the sister. And it, it uh, created uh, harmony in a difficult situation. In birth, uh, midwives assisted in the birth uh, in a special shelter. Here's a known midwife of Kenai, Matrona Peterson. Uh, she lived, uh, this picture was in 1903, and uh, I met her. Uh, she was old, uh, so, she lived, uh, so she lived a long time. Um, and uh, she was a known midwife, very famous, very well known, very important, of course, um, pre hospital. Uh, birth. Um, men were excluded unless a shaman's services were required. Osgood reports that childbearing was generally not difficult. <laughs> and some of you women who have had children are hearing this and saying, yeah, right. Uh, I'm just saying what he reports. <clears throat> Although, um, not that a fit person can't have a difficult child uh, birth. That's certainly possible. Uh, but uh, also, a fit person, a uh, fit woman, would tend to have a less, uh, a less of a hard time. So these were incredibly fit people, incredibly fit, and that may be what really Osgood was getting at. The mother and child were secluded in a shelter for about 40 days. The 40 probably comes from orthodoxy. 40 days is, uh, appears quite often. And the infant was placed in a moss-lined birch bark cradle or in a moss-lined skin bag. So these infant bags were uh, moss-lined as, uh, as diapers, essentially. Uh, I believe there's one in the exhibit in Anchorage at the, um, at the museum uh, in Rasmussen Museum in, in Anchorage, uh, in that wonderful exhibit they have from the Smithsonian. Women were said to give birth to six to eight children, although uh, it's likely not all survived, and children were nursed from one to five years. That's not uncommon, uh, very common to nurse children for uh, extended periods of time, at least compared to our weaning at a much younger age. <clears throat> Naming was uh, sometime, sometime during the first two years often named for a dead relative. Uh, there was a concept of um, of the soul returning uh, to be reborn, uh, not necessarily with a memory of previous life, but with a memory of a sense of purpose. And if that were the case, then often that would be named for a dead relative. Names were given for life. Technonymous names were used. Um, that's be to address a parent as the mother or father of the eldest child or of a child. So I would be known as Kristen's father, for example. Children were highly prized. Girls tended to, tended to be preferred over boys because they were reported to Osgood as being less trouble. 
and <laughs> there you go. Um, and uh, I can say that's true in my case, yeah. Uh, my daughter is definitely less trouble. They're all great kids, though. Orphans were readily adopted by a close relative. Usually the mother was of the same clan as the child, so the new mother, the adopted mother. So that, again, continuity. If there was no close relative, a geshka was obligated to adopt the child, another role for the geshka, and, uh, but the child retained his or her clan membership. That was fundamental to identity. The training and education, young boys were usually sent to live with their mother's brother to learn the ways of manhood about the age of six, and the training was rigorous, whereas girls learned <clears throat> from their mother and aunties, as we had talked about. Peter Kalifornsky was one of the last of the uh, Coquinlet Denina to have been brought up in the old-time way. Uh, he told me and others the story at a young age of uh, being sent across the inlet to live with his mother's brother, who was Theodore Chickalusian. The Although Theodore Chickalusian was very important and famous, he, he was a, a chief, uh, and he was also um, important in the uh, Alaska Commercial Company. I think he owned the store. Busy guy. Very famous. One of the most important people in Cook Inlet. So the job was actually farmed out to, I think it was, uh, it was a relative, same, you know, same clan relative named, uh, Peter called Old Man Carp. It's in the book as is what his Denina name is. I don't remember it right now. But Old Man Carp uh, at Polly Creek put him through some really uh, vigorous uh, training. He, Peter said that if he didn't get up right away in the morning he'd get cold water in the face and he'd often have to swim a stream before breakfast or run a, run a half a mile or so. Uh, and then after breakfast they would do training teaching, teaching him how to set traps, how to track animals, how how to hunt, how to shoot a bow, how to do, and a gun in that case, how to do all those things that were important to being an adult male in um, Denina society. Uh, Peter would, I'd, I'd ask Peter, so how was it? You know, it was rough, huh? And he's, oh, it's great. It's a great time, best time of my life. Uh, he loved it, uh, just the way some um, military people think back of boot camp or or maybe uh, maybe you're an athlete and you think about the tough training you went through at one time or maybe you still are an athlete and how you embrace that so it was uh, it was I was considered to be a good time but it was very prescribed you know who would, who did the training and the girls then learned from their aunties here's a picture at one of the Denina language institutes in at the college here and uh, the, the 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 young women there are getting getting a um, oversight, <laughs> shall we say, from their aunties and beating and they're beating. So uh, illustrates that idea. Female puberty uh, at first menstruation, a girl was confined to an attached hut where she lived up to a year and only visited by her mother and her aunties, and further taught her the skills and the ways of womanhood. Um, during that time, she was not to look at anyone. She went outside, and when she went outside, she had to cover her face, look at the ground, in some cases wearing a special mask. Um, uh, many taboos were recognized involving food and drink, one, for example, this, this drinking tube. This is in the Peabody Museum in at Yale University. That's the tube there. I think it's bone. Has this dentalium shell and beads, and she would wear this and always drink through that particular tube at, during puberty and during menstruation. And uh, for the, as far as the puberty right, after that she was free to marry. 
1900 census, which is the first enumeration we have, indicates women married in their late teens or, or early 20s. So this was that transition from, um, from being a child to being a woman. And we'll talk about it being a liminal state after we talk about the male puberty ceremony. So the male ceremony we know less about. It occurred about the age of 15. Again, recognizing that transition to adulthood, uh, usually consisting of a prolonged fast, but we don't know the other details. Um, it, it had no one asked the right question, I guess. Or maybe it was considered uh, privileged information uh, and uh, therefore not told. And that's, of course, people's right. After, he was a man and expected to contribute like a man. And the 1900 census indicates most men in that time married in their late 20s, 28, 29 or so. So there was often 10 years difference between husband and wife. So how do we contextualize these puberty ceremonies? Uh, Victor Turner has uh, is elaborated on the concept of liminal states a timeless, spaceless state of intensity in a religious or secular ceremony uh, or a prolonged state such as a rite of passage. And these are rites of passage moving from one status to another. If it's done in a communal situation it's called communitas where people in a group are achieving this liminal state for a time. Um, so from the, from the Denina standpoint Put, let me back up. These are frequently religious states, uh, religious, um, religiously based, but it can be secular. You know, you're you know, not to trivialize it, but your big, heavy-duty rock concert is that liminal state, timeless, maybe spaceless. For the puberty ceremony, this was a transition from childhood and adulthood, and it was very it made made a clear break we don't have such a clear break in our society today when are you an adult you know we sort of have various markers of it the high school graduation driver's license things like that but we don't have a, a really clear um, break and therefore that ambiguity can cause confusion um, for the Denina, though, uh, that uh, liminal state is very powerful because you're not, during that ceremony, you are not one or the other. You're not a child, but you're not yet an adult. And often this is one of the greatest times of clarity, greatest times of introspection, greatest times of thought. When you're in this in-betwixt stage, you could argue, I think, that college experience is a kind of liminal state. You're not in the workforce, although most of you do work. You're not, you're not in one or the other, but you can have these moments because of the liminal state of clarity of thought. The taboos are important and the ceremonies are important because they recognize that, um, that, that status so you're different. You're not a regular member of the village. You're not a regular member of society. Hence the drinking tube. Hence the not looking at someone else. Hence the living in a special place. These are all part of taboos that recognize to the broader society your status. Uh, other liminal states, the potlatch, particularly the funeral potlatch and the funeral itself, the quest for Echeltani, we'll talk about these later, but those two are these powerful liminal states that occurred in Denina culture. So adulthood then, um, uh, adults functioned as part of that Avunki local group, Ukilka. Uh, gender roles, homosexuality was recognized and considered normal. So there was no stigma uh, associated with homosexuality. And this is, as far as I know, true of most uh, uh, indigenous cultures, at least in North America. In fact, often uh, homosexual has given special status um, for their uh, 
uh, for their insight. The Alutig nearby, uh, Kodiak Island and Southern Peninsula, had the Burdash, third gender. This would be not necessarily homosexual, but a male who would dress and act as a female and vice versa. Uh, it's not clear whether the Denina had the Burdash or not. The Burdash is a Plains Indian term, uh, Plains uh, 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 Lakota and so on had that Burdash. Uh, whether the Denina did or not, uh, I don't think anyone knows. So uh, we'll um, end this, oh, two other points before we cut this one off. These are calendar strings. These were sort of rediscovered in the Alaska Museum by the Kanaitse tribe um, in the 90s, early 90s, I believe. Um, where they had been stored, and it came from Kenai, but they would have been common in all Denina territory. They're sinew and uh, have knots in them. So if you count the knots, there would be 52 on these. So these are post-contact. Obviously, there's beads here. Uh, so they're recognizing the 52 weeks of the year is what I take it to be. And every so often there'd be a, a bead tied in uh, or strung in or a piece of uh, claw, a piece of um, um, string or uh, tied in to mark events. So these would be a record of life events through the year. And then year after year you would build up these so any given individual would have life events marked by um, beads or string or something tied into these to this year. Uh, they're remarkable. Uh, I think they're very interesting. I had a student who did a class project uh, based on these. She had her fourth grade class. Uh, you take string and she got some beads for them and they uh, they decided what their significant life events were even though they were these little kids and then they had to stand up in front of class and talk about their life and she said it was so moving it was it was little kids who hardly talked in class would stand up there and talk about their life the good part this is the time i made the hockey team or this is when grandpa died the bad part and and it became this mnemonic device for them so moving that she invited all the parents and adults to come and they had a night and every kid stood up and talked about their life and the parents said I didn't know that I didn't know that he can or she considered that important so calendar strings there's a Denina name for them I can't remember it right now but this would be part of one's life uh, daily life then it was a virtue to rise early fires were built by the by the commoners we'll talk about that sort of quasi uh, class system Boys brought in the wood. You can kind of imagine that fireplace of the of the Nichilsh that we had a little drawing of, and water. Uh, chores and tasks according to the season. The main meal in the evening, although the elderly and the children they get to graze during the day. Um, most some villages ate communally. Others uh, others uh, by household. Women make the meal, men eat first, women second, children third, dogs last. And uh, that was a pattern. And hospitality was considered a virtue. These are the some these beautiful bowls that are wooden that are in museums. Uh, both of these I think are in the Peabody Museum. Osgood collected them. Uh, this one for sure I can't remember where this one's from but these would be serving uh, plates um, fish based food probably hospitality is still a virtue in Denina villages and in Denina households uh, you welcome your guests so we're coming on to an hour. I'm going to stop this one here. We're at slide uh, 24 of social organization. I'll mark this social organization one and then um, 
later I'll finish this off, call it Social Organization 2. And uh, thank you for listening, and I hope the rest of your day is wonderful.